Hi, my name's Scott Bryant, and I want to welcome you to the Pioneer Network audio broadcast from Opelika First Assembly, our home church. For more information about the Pioneer Network, our outreach center, our ministry school, or our gatherings at Opelika First Assembly, please go to www.thepioneernetwork.org. Enjoy the message. That guy can preach. <laughs> How many of you needed to hear that this morning? <laughs> Today we continue and actually conclude a series on identity. Uh, felt the first of the year the Lord spoke to me and, and said, uh, I guess he was speaking to me because, you know, anything I preach comes to me. Sometimes it's just beneficial to others. But it's really God just talking to me about me. And what I really felt in my spirit was one of the one of the things that I, I think makes us slip and fall and drift away from faith in God is not knowing who we are. Amen. So I thought if we started the year off in a series called Identity, that would be pretty simple. Because the key to it is knowing whose you are defines who you are. I don't know if you want me to say that again, but knowing whose you are determines and defines who you are. I'm going to be in the book of Hebrews this morning. And uh, I'm probably not going to be uh, as uh, fired up as the dude on the video, but he kind of fired me up because... When Jesus went to the cross, he changed the game. And when people sit in churches every week reiterating that. But my thing is, I wonder why we still walk around defeated knowing that a living Jesus with all the creative power of the universe lives inside of us. How can we halfway live? I, I'm going to tell you how. That's why we went to Hebrews. See, we don't even have an author for the book of Hebrews. So I can't tell you such and such wrote this. But I do know the audience. And the audience were Hebrew believers in Jesus. Here's the issue. If Whoever the author of Hebrews would write a letter to the church in America today, he would probably call it Hebrews. Because what the book was written to were a group of people that wanted to hold Moses' hand and Jesus' hand at the same time. Okay, we got some work to do. Uh, some of you, that's just fresh to you. Like, I thought that's how you got people saved. Like you walk them through the Ten Commandments. Have you ever done? Have you ever lied before? You know all that kind of stuff. It's not how you lead somebody to Jesus. You confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus was both the Son of God and that He died for your sins. You will be saved. It's as simple as that. You don't have to have somebody lead you through some ritual to let you know you were a sinner. We were all born broken. Go to any daycare. In Lee County. And go to the toddler room. And see that sin nature exists. Mine! And if you try to take what's mine, I'll bite you. And we, we laugh about it because we blame it on kids. Grown-ups are worse than that. 
Because we've been trained our whole life the wrong things. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. And see, we don't realize that the, the law of Moses, which is perfect, it's a beautiful thing, was given to protect the people that God's seed would come through. Those laws were given to protect the, peace, the Hebrew people as they journeyed through strange lands and lived longer, lived healthier, their stuff lasted longer, all because of the law. Because it put a fence around God's seed until Jesus could be born and fix everything that was broken in the garden. So the garden was not God saying, I need a mulligan. The garden was God's initial plan to give him the most glory. Because if we could see our sin nature and know that there's a savior for that sin nature, then we have to give God glory for that. Problem is, we hold on to Moses' hand and try to hold on to Jesus' hand and we can't decide which one to follow. Well, eventually you're going to run into a mountain and you're going to have to choose. Yes. The book of Hebrews addresses this. And we're not going to go through the whole uh, chapter 10. We're in chapter 10, by the way. Chapter 10. I'm not going to go through the whole book of Hebrews. Chapter 10, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. You guys know me well enough to know. Uh, that would take a minute. But I want to give you a little bit of context on this. Because what would happen is when you would sin, and you will sin, right? Right. Um, Nobody in the room would raise their hand out. Anybody sin today? Okay. The rest of you were either just didn't hear me or, you know. I'm being politically correct today. <laughs> Liars. <laughs> um. What would happen, though, is you would sin. And... They had this place called the temple and it was a tent way back when, the tabernacle. But inside the tent or inside the temple there was a most holy place. And uh, there was an altar of sacrifice outside. But there was a most holy place. That's where God lived. That's where God dwelt. And you would bring, especially once a year, man, it was loaded. Once a year. Uh, you would bring your burnt offerings, you would bring these animals, preferably your best animals, to the temple. And they would cut their throat. Peter would have been all freaked out. But they would cut their throat, they would sprinkle some blood on the altar, then they would take some of the blood to the most holy place of one animal, and only one person could go in. Now one person would take this blood for the entire nation, and this one person would go in, and he had to be right. Like he had to be ceremonial clean. He had to be in good standing. And, and here's the thing. If he wasn't, the only way he was coming out is by somebody dragging him out. Because this one person would go in there and he would sprinkle blood once a year. They had to do it every year. Now, the reason I know things have changed is because none of you out there in the parking lot got a bull or a goat that you brought to church with you. Anybody? I was going to say, I mean, you never know in Auburn. <laughs> We're safe, this is a like it. Um, but basically, when Jesus came, he did away with the ceremonial system of that. Because God said all through the Old Testament, like, I'm not pleased with your burnt offerings. Like, the things that you think are awesome are filthy rags. And really what I want is your obedience. And you know what? They wouldn't listen. They just kept doing it, kept doing it. Sound familiar? 
So something tells me that if I'm going to hold Moses' hand, I got issues. Because now you can't find a place to go sacrifice a bull or a goat. Well, I'm sure you could. There's weird places, but it wouldn't have anything to do with getting right with God. Jesus did away with it. In verse 11, chapter 10. And every priest stands, stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Follow me now. Which can never take away sin. System's broken. Priests in there just cutting, slaughtering, got blood everywhere. It looks like some off Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And it doesn't work. So we're going to go to verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Hey, if that don't scream done, because none of the other priests had a seat. They were too busy to sit down. Like they didn't even put a chair in there. You can't rest. You don't have time. You got people all, you got Hebrew people all around the world that are coming to one place to make these sacrifices. So you're going to be so busy that you ain't even going to have a seat in your, could you imagine your office not having a seat in it? And Jesus walks in to one sacrifice, one time. And he goes and sits down. Man, that's confidence there. The thing is, Jesus didn't doubt. He had total confidence in his sacrifice. He had total confidence that it is finished, man. It is finished. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. But by a single offering. He has perfected. Wait, say that with me. He has what? Perfected. He has perfected. It's the last time I checked, this is a past tense word. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now look, that I don't know if you read that right, but just try it with me for a second because he said a past tense word with a process. So what that means is he knows you are already perfect as you are being made perfect. That means before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew that he was enough. Yes. And all the question was, was would your faith touch his grace? Yes. Because if your faith touches his grace, there is no need to do anything but keep coming. Keep showing up. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Are you going to mess up? Yeah, I'm going to mess up. Yeah, you all are. I'm not going to tell you that you need to keep coming back here to get fixed. We're not in the sin management business. For one time, sacrifice was made for all. Does that mean you don't need to be coming back to the church? We're going to get to that in a minute. But we're not, we're not asking you to come back every week hanging a carrot in front of you saying, next week we're going to fix you. Like, next, we're going to, and keep the carrot keeps moving backwards. What we're going to tell you is the good news. Jesus went to the cross one time for everybody. Amen. So that means if you want to plug in and walk this journey, wake your butt up. <laughs> because 
Being confident in the work of God requires attentiveness. You have to know what he did for you. That was pretty neat right there. Like he's, he's did, He did it before I was formed in my mother's womb. And he gave me a call. He placed that stuff in me. Like he said it was all going to happen. And now he is bringing me. He is sanctifying me. I am in process of becoming what he sees down the road. What? Well, I don't get that, man. Like, how do you hear stuff like that and not run around the room? Because knowing that God spoke something into you before you were ever born that was your perfection, and now He is working it out. My Lord. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. What? Like this is Old Testament stuff. Like he told them in the Old Testament he was going to make a new one. <laughs> I will put my laws on their heart. Not, not the Ten Commandments. On their heart. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds... Well, this is, this is too much for me. Because I think there's only a fraction, like a very small fraction of Christians that actually even believe this. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Man, why do I keep going back? Why do I keep going back? You keep going back, then you keep coming down. You keep going back, then you keep coming down. And you keep coming back and you keep coming down. And you keep coming down to the altar and you keep saying, God, I just want you to get this out of me. And he said, what? <laughs> you remember stuff he's done for God. Does he know you struggle with it? Absolutely he does. But he's paid for it. And he's not going to keep paying a bill that's been paid. Amen. Man, you let somebody send me a bill that I've already paid. <laughs> Return to sender. Yes, sir. So every time you keep coming back asking for forgiveness for something, every time you keep playing those, those checklists in your mind about the sins you've done today, yeah. oh, I've got to search my heart. I've got to know that my heart's pure. I've got to bring a pure vessel to the church. I've got to... Man, you're either clean or you're not, man. Jesus has either done it or he didn't. If you think any different, then you're holding on to Moses' hand. You might as well go down here to the cattle barn, buy you a bunch of bulls, buy you a bunch of goats, and stay at home on Sunday killing them and offering them to God. Go build you an altar, see if you can find a high priest, because according to my Bible, there's only one high priest that can intercede for us anyway. You keep holding Moses' hand if you want to. Where the law is, sin abounds. Mm. Whoa. Whoa. And the scriptures actually say the law is the power of sin. Turn loose of Moses' hand. Turn, turn loose of it. There's a new covenant. Like a new covenant. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What does that mean? Like, uh-oh. Uh I'm not going to go too far with this because I could go too far with this and actually just really confuse some people. But that means pretty much what it says. That there's no longer any offering for sin. You can't bring anything to God that's going to make you any more righteous than you are the moment you believe in Him. I'm going to show you why. Therefore, see, I had to read those verses to get to the therefore because if you see therefore in the Bible, you have to back up and read. Y'all know that, right? Okay, brothers, therefore, brothers and sisters, this is like a, it's not a, like, you, you get me. Since we have, say that word with me. 
Confidence. Man, don't you want some confidence? Yes. Like, how many, if we, if we were absolutely honest, how many of you say you have some confidence issues? They, but here's the thing. My phone never rings with somebody saying, man, I'm in a confidence crisis. <laughs> Like, nobody ever calls me and says, man, my confidence level, man, it's actually an issue. Redlining. This is a 911 alert. My confidence is gone. Nobody ever calls and says, tells me that. But the thing is, when you ask a room full of people who, who deals with confidence issues, everybody shoots their hand up. You know why? Because life. You do realize that, right? Man, I wish more. I wish somebody could just walk in my shoes for one month, uh. and, and 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 if and if you do have any hair left, it's going to be white. <laughs> because, and I'm not, and, and I'm sure many of you out there deal with twice as much stress as I do. But sometimes I just can't handle the roller coasters. You know, the up, down, up, down. Yeah. Just a hospital visit. Where you go from visiting somebody that's in their late 90s. That the doctor's so confused he don't know what to do. Yeah. And you run into a friend downstairs that has a grandfather that's in ICU. That passes. And then the other side of the hospital, <coughs> there's babies being born. Do you realize how wigged out a pastor is that does a lot of hospital visits? I mean, could you imagine going from the prenatal ward to the ICU? Not to mention the phone calls. I've got another pastor friend. We call him alternately. We're trying to, sometimes we call them each other the same week. And it's by, like, by Monday, Monday morning. You ready to quit this week? Yeah. You? <laughs> Wish it could. Can't. God called me. Got to do it. So we all deal with confidence issues. But he says, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain. Oh, you're, you're not even ready for this. You remember I said there was that inner, that holy of holies place, right? Had, had a veil there. And we're familiar with pieces of, of what happened like at Calvary. Like the veil was rent from top to bottom. But Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is actually giving it a really deep description. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. When the curtain was rent, so was his body. Yeah. See, it came at a price to God for us to be set free. <coughs> While, so, would somebody get him water? Um, if, I'm in because of distraction. Would somebody grab a bottle of water, please? Uh, I thought, Carl, I thought people would just know that. <laughs> but y'all are paying such close attention. I, I, I get that. Since we have a confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, that meant that while his flesh was being torn, so was the curtain. And when the curtain was torn, that meant you and me can enter into the holy of holies, into the very presence of God. You get that, right? Yes. Okay, I know that was elementary, but that's pretty powerful stuff. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, what's that word? Let us. Let us. Because our identity so far has been about me, personally. But the writer of Hebrews says now, we're making it a little bit more corporate. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. What does that mean? 
See, we get things like this confused a lot. You know, we got to clean up the vessel. You got to do all this. You got to clean up the vessel. You got to. In full assurance of faith. Not in how good you are. Assurance of faith says, I know how good he was. I know that he did the work that I could never do. To give me blessings that I didn't deserve. And he actually took what he deserved as being spotless, sinless, and he gave it all to me. And he took what I deserved, which was the tearing of his flesh and death on the cross. Let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean. from an evil conscience. Wow. And our bodies washed with pure water. Now the Bible speaks of being washed with the water of the word. You understand that part, but the, I'll back up for a second. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. It's an intense word there. See, did you know the enemy cannot steal your calling? He can't. You can't even give it away. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. God's not going to take them back. Once he places it on your life, it's there. Boom, done. Now, so, how can the enemy work if I know the enemy can't steal my calling? He works through my conscience. Because if he can make me believe that the work of Christ was not enough, yeah. Yeah. then I live in condemnation every time I walk in the house of God. Yeah. Well, I'm broken. Well, I struggle. Yeah. Well, everything counter what God said about you. Because God said he placed the calling on your life before you were formed in your mother's womb. Yeah. Let him fulfill it. He's on the plan of sanctifying you because he's already perfected you outside the timeline. That's too heavy. <laughs> um, but if the enemy can get in our conscience, he can, he can keep us, at least deter us from stepping into our calling. Because if he's in your conscience, then everything's going to bother you. Everything you do, you're going to second guess, you're going to question. And guess what? You start questioning yourself, you're going to start acting on those questions. Does it make you any less gods? No. It makes you, here's what it does. It drives a wedge between you and your worship of God. Because if your conscience is dirty, oh, man, I, I can't lift my hands today. You watch people in free worship, and that looks a million different ways. You watch people in free worship, and you'll know somebody that's in free worship. You know one thing about them? They have a clean conscience. All it means is this. They're not playing games in their mind. They understand who God is and what he did for them. And that's just, it's, that, it's done. Does that mean they have to hoop and holler and jump? No. But if they want to, that's good. But if they want to sit there and just bawl their eyes out on their knees, that's good. If they want to sit there calmly and just, just, just peacefully let the presence of God fill them, that's good. But there's a confidence. Not in how awesome they are, but in how awesome He is. So that as long as the, the enemy of your soul that wants to kill, steal, and destroy, which by the way is not always the devil. <laughs> That's for another sermon another time. All the Bible says is the thief. So anybody wants to steal your joy? They're a thief. Washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession. Let us, me and you, 
all of us. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You have a clear conscience, you're not going to waver. You're going to stand. Hey, look, you're going to get up. You don't feel like praying, you're going to still press in. You're going to keep showing up. You're going to keep pressing on. You're going to keep doing it. Knowing that it's not you that's doing it. It's Him that's doing it through you. And then you're going to keep doing it. And you're going to wake up and you're not going to feel like it. And your conscience is going to be bad. And you're going to go, I am God's righteousness. Jesus paid it all for me. He washed me clean. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's you, if you have to tell yourself that every morning when you wake up, tell yourself that. Keep going. Put your shoes on and get after it for Jesus. Don't do it, do it without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We don't have to. We don't have to hash that because I would guarantee you that God has never lied to you. Because God cannot lie. He said, "Let there be light," and guess what? Still is. He never told it to stop. That's why they can't find the end of the galaxies. Because he didn't say stop. So I would say he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Do not, not neglect to meet together. Oh wait, wait, we're, we're, we're getting back there now. Well, it seemed like for a little while I was telling you not, you don't even have to come to church. <laughs> But see, we, if we don't gather in community, we can't stir each other up yes. to love and to good works. What are good works? Man, they're all kind of stuff. If you're doing it in the name of the Lord, that's good stuff. And I'm not talking about milking people for money in the name of the Lord. I'm talking about doing things without expectation of a return. Because Jesus was good to me. And if anybody asks you, man, well, why would you do that? There's got to be some kind of hook. See, I, I remember about 11 years ago when a man took me into his home yeah. with the clothes on my back. A drug addict. With no strings attached. I remember that. That's what you like to call good works. If there's a string attached, then it's not good works. It's manipulation. Or in the church, like we call sin management. <laughs> and it's a multi billion dollar business. Yes. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but in encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day. Drawing near. Yes. This day, right here, this day, the day that's drawing near is a day closer than it was yesterday. When's it coming? I ain't going to give you a date. I've seen wing nuts do that for years and years and years. But I know one thing it's a day closer than it was yesterday. Let us. Let us. That's going to require action of us. Let us. Let us what? Let us draw near. Keep showing up. I'm not saying the church. Keep showing up. Keep showing up as a Christian. Keep getting up. Keep putting your clothes on. Keep looking in the mirror and saying I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Keep showing up. Things don't look right. Things haven't changed. Things haven't. You haven't seen much progress. It depends on what you're weighing your progress against. Because if you're weighing your progress against other people and other people's callings, then you're still holding on to Moses' hand. The reason you were created different than everybody else because you have a calling that's different than everybody else. Just keep showing up. Keep showing up and watch God reveal glory to glory, grace to grace. And each day, each day knowing that he's fulfilling because he's faithful he's fulfilling the promise that he's perfected and he is doing in you that are being sanctified 
That's why grace is messy, man. Man, it's messy. But see, we think we can fix people. And that's where we mess up. You take a moron like me and say I can fix anybody and people will actually believe that. Well, he seems to be doing all right. And they don't know me. Just keep showing up. Let us hold on. So draw near. Hold on. Hold on to what? To the one who will never leave or forsake you. So you show up every day. You just keep showing up, knowing God's faithful. Be confident in that. I'm, I'm just going to show up. I'm going to show up. I'm gonna, I, it might look bad. I'm going to show up. And I'm going to hold on. Because I know that He is faithful. And let us stir each other up. See? I'm going to go back one to this hold on thing. Because some of you would say, man, you don't know my testimony. Like, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know mine. We could, we could talk about that all day. Because some of us have been in some bad places. We've had some tough things happen. But you know one thing I do know? You made it. Everybody in this room, you made it. It doesn't matter what it was. For you to be in this room today means you made it. So hold on. Because he's faithful. And as long as you got breath in your lungs, guess what? You made it. But let us know that we're not in this alone. See, every one of you, every one of you, every one of you has to work out your Christian walk by yourself. But nobody can walk out their Christian walk by themselves. So you got to do it on your own. But you can't do it alone. So you have to do the work. You have to get up. You have to show up. You have to believe. You have to hold on. But the benefit is knowing that you can't do it by yourself. And nobody wants everybody knowing all the business. I understand that. But I want to tell you this. If you see Jesus in somebody, you know the Jesus you see in them, he already knows all of it anyway. <laughs> and he still loves you. So if they're really Christians, they're going to love you in spite of whether they want to or not. Amen. And they're going to walk with you. So be selective. You can't just go out and pick anybody. Because you can't trust everybody. But the thing is, you just, you just keep showing up. And you keep holding on. And you keep knowing that when you're around gospel community, we are here for a purpose, and that's to stir each other up into love and good works. Oh, let's do. Yeah, I got a minute. We're going to skip all the way down to verse 32. You see how good I was, man? I, I jumped a bunch of verses, not on purpose, because I just know we'll, we would run out of time. But recall the former days. When after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. 
Wait, wait, wait. What you're saying, Scott, is that there's going to be bad days after I believe? <laughs> the writer says, recall the former days when this bad stuff happened. And this is so weird. Because a lot of times when we tell people, forget what's behind you. And forget the past. There is a certain part of your past that would be better forgotten. I mean, you're not going to be able to forget it. I mean, that's just ludicrous. But there is a part of your past after you're a believer that you're going to hurt and you're going to suffer. And the Bible says, recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with suffering. This confused me. Because how could me looking back to my painful moments help me moving forward? Because I'll just be honest with you. Some of the toughest times after me being saved in my life happened in ministry. Yeah. And some of the toughest hurts. And when I regurgitate that, it hurts again. But the Bible says, recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured hard struggle with sufferings. And I was kind of pondering this last night because I was like, how could that do me any good? He wasn't trying to make it easy. He was trying to make me better. Because through a hard time, you have a choice to act like the world or act like the regenerate child of God that you are. And sometimes, that's hard. I'm going to read one more verse and i got a quick illustration. It's going to be quick too. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Now let me back up. We're going to do the. I need three people. Let me, can I get three people that don't mind coming up here? Um, no, Roger and Ben and Mary, very animated. We got to you, come on. All right, here's here's the thing. You stand right here and face this way. Okay. Now, Brian Smith sent a group text out the other day, and I, I read it, and it was about talking about the process of his journey. He's coming up on four years and, uh, since he came to New Birth and he was talking about something. But see, I know something about all of us in this room that, that there is a place where we know we want to go. Right? But, but there's a place where we are and it's like you can reach out and touch it sometimes but you're still not there yet and you got to keep getting up showing up and see we spend the majority of our teaching and our discipleship in this space here getting from where we are to where we need to go but I think the writer of Hebrews was saying, hey, you forgot one. You forgot. You forgot this gap. Y'all look that way. You forgot this one. See, you've got a place that you want to be. You've got a place that you are. But Hebrews says, hey, both of y'all, look over your shoulder at where you used to be. Because you used to be there. And if you ever need to be encouraged, know that you're not where you need to be. You're right here. But you're not where you used to be. And I'm going to tell you, every time you do this analysis, the distance is going to be greater than it is in this gap. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. 
Sometimes you just need to remember back where God's taking you from. Because, yeah, it might not be perfect right now. It might not look perfect. It might not seem perfect. It might not even seem like I'm ever going to reach that place. But if I could just look back to where I used to be, I can at least celebrate God. You've got to be faithful if you brought me this far. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Wow. Which has a great reward. You have need. You have need. I have need. We all have need of this word right here. Endurance. Man, that's, that's, that's the thing. Endurance. You know what that is? The ability to go through it. And if you can't lean into it, you're never going to go through it. So when you hit a pain pressure point and you want to run back to that old place, you'll never get through it. So you need a little bit of endurance. The Bible says you need a little bit of endurance so that when, not, not if, when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Amen. So you see the thing is if we know whose we are we won't have near the problem knowing who we are. So let us let us Y'all supposed to already know these three. I don't want them to stir up. Maybe we can work backwards. Uh, let's go back in the notes because y'all just haven't paid a bit of attention. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let us hold on. Let us stir each other up. If we can remember these things, church, I'm going to tell you, we can walk as Christians knowing that it's not us doing the work, it's Him doing the work. He did the work 2,000 years ago. We just got to draw near to that. We got to hold on to that. And then we got to stir each other up to say, hey, you can do it. I know you're feeling bad right now. I know you're going through something right now. But you can do it. God's created you for more because it's in you. You can do it. Just keep showing up. Keep Stepping. And that's not in a negative connotation. Uh, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Because knowing that you're going to hit some tough spaces and they're going to be painful and they're going to be tough. But you know what? You've got to lean into that. You've got to lean into the dis discomfort because when you lean into that discomfort, that means that eventually you're going to get all the way through it. So look. If for some reason if the Holy Spirit's been tugging at your heart and you're saying like I, I don't know man I, I, I don't even I don't even know Jesus but I, I really want to get on this I want, really want to get on board with this if that's you uh, if I you do something really weird because you'll know if it's you or not because the Holy Spirit is kind of bold uh, if, if that's you if, if you're knowing you need to know Jesus and, and step out Step up, stand up, kept whatever. Come down here and stand right now. But remember, if he's already paid for it, he's already paid for it. But if he's never paid for it, let's do some business. So you can't still say awkward. I'm the king of awkward especially when it comes to altar calls but I know when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart you got to handle business it doesn't matter okay it keeps it easy because like I could give you an altar call that could fill these altars up but I don't want to gauge today off that I want to gauge today off how we live after we walk out these doors that'll show us See, we're, on, we're in a marathon. We ain't in any kind of hurry. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that you seal this word 
in us. And I pray that across this room, whoever's team they're rooting for, that everybody gets their prayer answered. And both teams win. But I, seriously, I pray that we would realize whose we are and that we would walk in who we are. Today we pray for Sharon. God, I pray that you send a healing touch to Sharon right now. That it is by your stripes that she is healed and we'll continue to confess that. I pray for Jim. God, you touch him. Supernatural grace. I pray for Rod. I pray healing in his body. I pray that you would just continue to bring healing into his body. I pray for Miss Odie right now. That God, from the top of her head to the sole of her feet, God, your supernatural grace, your healing virtue that you promised would flow. I pray, God, pour out your spirit on her. Healing and peace. In Jesus' name. God, all around this room, in all these families, so many needs. You have a finished word, God. Create in us a clean heart by the sprinkling of your blood. Renew a right spirit in us, God. We thank you. We praise you that you seal this word today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Have a blessed day. In Jesus' name.